welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jenna and I'm with Emerging Destinations. We represent cool companies in cool places. Today, uh, you can also see up there on your screen, um, Ross Hawkins, who's joining us um, from uh, Makuleki today. Uh, he is the head instructor at Makuleki Camp, which is located in Kruger National Park in South Africa. So he has uh, taken time out of his evening to be here live to give you this presentation. So um, before, before I pass things over to him, though, I will take a quick minute to introduce our portfolio to you. So, of course, we are talking about uh, eco-training today, and therefore we are talking about um, our African products. So I will introduce to you um, our African portfolio. So on the top left uh, corner there, you can see Anne and Tara. We represent uh, two of their properties, uh, one in Zambia, the Royal Livingston, and the second in Mozambique. Uh, we have the Elowana collection. They have, uh, it's a set of 16 boutique lodges across Kenya and Tanzania. And then their sister company, Sky Safari, who offers, um, um, a sky safari experience between Elowana properties. Um, Babanango Game Reserve, they are a new up and coming game reserve also located in South Africa, about three hours outside of Durban. Uh, Sopa Lodges, who also have lodges across Kenya and Tanzania. And last but not least, Adventure Consults, who is a DMC in Uganda and Rwanda. So if you have any questions about any of those companies that you see up there on your screen, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is at the bottom. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, as well as um, you may also see that we do have a Europe and South African portfolio as well. So if there's any questions or if you'd like any digital information, et cetera, about any of those, don't hesitate to reach out to me. A couple of housekeeping items to go over before I hand things over to Ross. Uh, this webinar will be recorded as always. So if there is uh, something that comes up throughout the presentation, uh, don't worry, we will be sending out the recording to everyone, hopefully later this week, um, as well as all of our uh, previously recorded webinars are always posted on our Emerging Destinations YouTube channel and our Emerging Destinations website as well. So if you do uh, miss anything, you can always find uh, the webinars posted there, um, but I will definitely be sending them uh, the recording out to you in a webinar follow up. And last but not least, uh, Ross has taken time out of his evening, as I previously mentioned, to be here with us live today. So please feel free to um, type through any questions that you have throughout his presentation. Uh, we will do a live Q&A at the end of his, um, of his presentation. So if there's any comments, questions that you have, please feel free to type those through. And uh, we will try to answer as many of those as we can at the end, of course, time permitting. So I think that's all that I have to say. I will hand things over to you, Ross, to talk about uh, birding in Makuleki. Okay, well, good evening all. It's um, yeah, sort of interesting doing a presentation here in, up in Makuleke and also to be able to put out Makuleke to all of you. Um, it's just, I think one of the big things is obviously birding in Makuleke and also just birding in general, which is becoming quite a big draw. So yeah, thank you, Jenna, for, for this opportunity. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, first of all, um, birding is a pastime. Um, if you, when you sort of head out, no matter where you go, you're always going to find uh, birds. And generally nowadays, people are very interested in, in what they're hearing, what they're seeing, sort of getting out and sort of also using birds in their sort of safaris. Um, I mean, guides being able to, if you pick it up on oxpeckers or guinea fowl or even birds sort of alarming for something else, be it another maybe bird of prey or reptile, you know, but it's just sort of, it's just, and of course, yeah, enjoying that um, sound of bird life early in the morning. So that dawn chorus or evening chorus when uh, just nice quiet time and just listening to bird calls and just, yeah, feeling yourself immersed in, in what's going on around you. Um, so, I mean, why this birding becomes such a popular pastime? Well, yeah, it's sort of, it's something that has been on a global upward, um, if you talk about the States or in South Africa, but ultimately everyone 
early days when you wanted to get to see any bird life, it was the earlier collectors would go out and shoot them, um, get them in the hand, study them, and yeah, from there they say, okay, this was bird ABC. Whereas today you just pull out a pair of binoculars and no one gets harmed or shot or anything along that line. Um, and ultimately, you don't really need much. I mean, a pair of binoculars, a, a bird book or app to help you along the way. And it's, yeah, and also you can do it in your back garden. No real need to sort of travel anyway. So it becomes quite a very easy, ineffective, or sorry, inexpensive activity that you can do anytime, anyway, for that matter. Um, but otherwise, I mean, people sort of putting up feeders in their gardens just to sit and enjoy who comes down maybe you put up a bird bath and seeing what uh, bird life comes to enjoy the food and water that you've put out to them but also from a um, science point of view in South Africa it's sort of referred to as um, citizen science where individuals be they members of the public or anybody who is anyone um, just sort of bird, using bird watching as a means of gathering information on habitat, bird movements, migration. Uh, the Southern African Bird Atlas Project is one of the largest, if not the largest in Africa on uh, monitoring birds and very easy sort of information that's put out there by people who just take the time to enjoy bird watching. So moving on with technology and um, today there's an Quite a large number of um, printed field guides, but also bird apps that are available. Um, these examples on the screen of Newman's birds or Roberts. Roberts is sort of the, the leading sort of go-to in terms of just everything you need to know about the bird that you sort of looking at um, from its habits, habitat, what the birds, I mean, breeding cycle, feeding, if it's a migrant, when it moves, where it moves to, and but sort of there's a lot of information out there that just gives you so much access to get into to birding and particularly for youngsters sort of starting out of just sort of something easy to sort of get to know um, is yeah bird life um, so birding globally I and mean, there's an example here of um, from the u.s side of 47 45 million birders in the u.s if you look at sort of how much that contributes to GDP, um, I mean, you're talking now of people who are either staying at home or maybe they uh, subscribe to any twitching lists who pay money to go around and search for certain birds. Um, now, I mean, the state that sort of 18% of that will head out and spend money on birds in some way or form. So, I mean, 8 million Americans traveling abroad purely for birding. In the UK of 6 million or so registered birders. Um, it's becoming one of the most popular outdoor activities in South Africa. You can also see where the non-fiction books, and if you go into any uh, bookstore in South Africa, um, you'll certainly find the shelves quite full of a number of varieties of uh, bird, bird field guides. Also, the number of apps that are sort of coming out nowadays. To sort of help you identify um, these animals, so it's it's becoming a very easy, easily accessible uh, pastime that anybody and everybody is able to do nowadays. So just sort of looking at, I mean, when you head out and you think, all right, I'm going out on game drive, and you're looking for animals, but if you've got a, a global number of 10,000 plus minus species of birds, um, ranging from that literally a teaspoon of sugar to a hummingbird to a 100 kilogram ostrich um, that ultimately birds are everywhere wherever you go I mean certainly unless of course you deep sea diving or um, any other recreation you're not going to be finding fish all over the place but it's sort of wherever you look you're going to be finding bird life um, they occupy majority of um, systems on the on the site um, so so it's sort of, um, yeah, you can kind of, no matter where you go, you're going to find bird life. Um, they're able to occupy any niche, doesn't matter where, if it's um, 
being plant eaters to feeding on meat and plant to the, the large raptors that head out and also vultures sort of scavenging from carcasses. So no matter where you're going to be looking, you're going to be finding bird life. Um, they ultimately, they're also able to adapt to our environment. That uh, So the term can be in commensal, um, where birds out there are able to sort of utilize habitats that have been altered by us. Um, and as a result, we have a number of species that do move around the globe, thanks to our sort of um, our own movements. So moving on then to the crux of tonight, uh, Makuleke, uh, what makes it so unique? I mean, some of these images yeah, might have been taken some time back, but just sort of hopefully yeah, they'll sort of give you a little bit of insight into Makuleke and what it's worth. Um, I mean, all the information you're going to be reading that you've been seeing tonight is courtesy of Duncan McKenzie, a very well-known um, birder and probably one of the country's better, uh, best birders. Um, so yeah, this sort of information, thank you to him. Um, so ultimately, where's Makuleke? Looking at a map, take Kruger National Park, the easiest um, icon to sort of work in the country, and then ultimately, go right up to the top of uh, Kruger National Park to the border of Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And that's ultimately where you're gonna find Makuleke. Um, tucked in between the Limpopo River and the Levuvu River. So you've got Zimbabwe to the north, Mozambique just off to the east. So that's ultimately where you're gonna find us right up at the top of South Africa. Um, in terms of sort of of yes, yeah, sort of diversity wise, I mean, we have the the lowest rainfall in the park. I mean, it's quite something to think that such a rich area um, has such a low rainfall. And then literally about maybe just under 100 kilometers south of us, Punda Maria area has almost one of the highest areas uh, rainfall of the park. So quite a contrast of what's sort of available. Technically, it's arid savanna up top here. Grass is generally very low. Uh, it's predominantly dominated by uh, mopani and and woody uh, plant uh, plant life. So you're looking at 200 meters above sea level to around Crook's Corner at 409 meters. Some of the higher ridges, maybe just over 300 meters. So not very high in terms of ridges and and the like. Uh, tree species mopani is the dominant tree species up here and for the majority of, of Kruger National Park for that matter. Uh, Baobab is very iconic in terms of seeing these, which you'll also find as you go further north in Kruger, Baobabs become a lot more prominent in the surrounding uh, vegetation. So geology wise, I mean, Makuleke is uh, three geological zones. If you look at Got extensive sandstone cliffs, uh, ridges, and sand felt um, to the west. Um, these run along the, um, the northern bank and southern section of the Levuvu River. The central basalt ridges and two alluvial, alluvial river valleys of the Liv Limpopo and Levuvu. Um, so quite a quite a contrast of of habitats that will be thanks to um, the geology as you see here. Then. Makuleke in, is ultimately one of South Africa's best known birding destinations, probably listed as you could say probably the top in the country um, because of when I sort of get through to describe some of the habitats. But ultimately, you've got an area covering in the region of around 24,000 hectares, which is 1% of Kruger National's surface area. From a biodiversity point of view, you're looking at around 75% of Kruger's biodiverse life can be found up in Makuleke. And from a bird point of view, bird list of around 450 species, of which Kruger's bird list is just 100, or yeah, just over 100 more than that. Um, so ultimately 90% of Kruger's total species list can be found up in Makuleke. Um, obviously summer would be higher than winter. And then this combination of varied habitats, our, our tropical location, we're just north of the uh, Tropic of, Ca of Capricorn. So, so as a result, now with all these different habitats and what have you, it just makes life great for, for bird life uh, to ultimately come and reside up the side. 
So if you then look at some of the, um, the distribution maps of some of these birds, some of them just enter South Africa in their southerly most distribution into entering into the Limpopo Valley, or ultimately they reach their westernmost distribution, in other words, coming west from Mozambique. They just, just enter Makuleke in terms of their distribution for the Southern African region. And then many low felt species that are not only confined to Kruger National Park, but also ultimately birds that are found nowhere else in the country. Um, again, sort of making their home here in Kruger. So these, whenever you sort of are coming up into this area, are then referred to as the Makuleke specials. Um, that would be the ones you'd be sort of looking for. Um, so some of those, for example, in crested guinea fowl, white breast cuckoo shrike white crowned lapwing, um, African golden oriole, which is not a very common bird at all for South Africa, three-banded corsa, um, honest chat, graded parrot, southern yellow white eye, single kukul, black-throat wattle-eye, um, thick bill cuckoo, tropical boo-boo, and then certainly on everybody, everyone's list, the Pell's fishing owl, which although this is one of the strongholds up top, it's still quite an elusive bird to get hold of. Um, Eastern Nicator, very much a forest bird. Pennant wing nightjar, which just enters South Africa in these sort of good uh, Mapani woodlands. Uh, Meave starling, which ultimately it's most common up in the north. Mottled spine tail, berm spine tail, two very special uh, birds that you're ultimately not going to any, be getting anywhere else. Lemon breasted canary. Um, and then the other nice prize is Racketail roller, which only just enters South Africa up here in this um, top corner. And of course, there are a multitude of others to sort of look at, especially from a Kruger point of view. So again, diversity wise, raptors, 51 species, rollers, all of um, Southern Africa's five species can be found here, but this would no doubt be in summer as the European roller and broadbill rollers will head north um, sort of from around late February, early March onwards. Cuckoos, up to 11 species, again, uh, majority of summer visitors. Doves, owls at, at nine, 10 species, bee eaters. Um, warblers, so for those that are sort of looking at not just big and easy to identify, but certainly the, the little jobs, 28 species, starlings, eight species. And then certainly from a red data list point of view, uh, 34 birds recording Makuleke are on this so that again just shows the importance as well of makuleke for our threatened birds in particular with regards to the wetlands that are to be found up um, in makuleke on the limpopo and levuvu so getting on to habitats um, that's sort of on on, off, on on offer up here so you have six broad scale vegetation communities um, so in other words when you're looking at vegetation, they're sort of broken up into, into segments. So subtropical alluvial vegetation, low felt riverine, Mopani basalt, Limpopo ridge, uh, bushveld, Mokuleke sandy bushveld, and Mosina Mopani bushveld. So these were then sort of from a birding point of view, sort of then break down into the seven main habitats, which then gives you seasonal floodplain pans, uh, the riverbeds themselves, Sand felt with cliffs and rocky outcrops, thorn felt, few tree forest, Mopani woodland, riparian forest. So as we'll sort of go into each of these in the slides to come is ultimately this mix just gives you a good rundown of potentially what you could be looking for when you do come out to, um, to Makuleke to the side. So start with seasonal plain pans. So these are very or highly seasonal because it depends on how much rain does fall in the area so all these pans I mean, ultimately majority of them are along the Limpopo River and then there's two or three to be found along the Luvuvu. Um, now a number of these pans are ultimately dependent on higher volumes of rain for example Banini uh, the first one up um, situated on the far western side of Makuleke that ultimately it's you're looking at around 108 hectares or so of literally water, um, which then is just in other years bone dry. So this year, for example, it's dry, whereas last year it was one massive, almost looked like a small inland lake. 
Um, then you have Hulukulu, Spokanyol, uh, Makwazi, Palmflay, um, and Mapimbi. These are all then on, along the Limpopo, whereas Reedbuck and Wambi are situated along the Luvuvu floodplains. Um, so bird species diversity is certainly on the up, in particular when these pans are actually um, at their at their best. So, and then bird levels in terms of water birds are sort of really good, particularly once the water starts to recede, because once that starts to recede, then by now fish have spawned and eggs are starting to hatch and young are starting to grow up, which gives food for those water birds, certainly out looking for, to feed hungry mouths. So in other words, in addition to this open water, mudplain habitats, Number of pans with floodplain grasslands dominated by Sporobolus consimilis. Unfortunately, no common name for that one. Uh, the palm felt dominated by the northern lala palms. So these now attract a number of additional floodplain species that wouldn't quite be reliant on the water itself, but certainly the habitat surrounding the water, that if it if that wasn't there, then they wouldn't be there. So you're looking at various duck species, uh, which generally for Kruger. It's not quite a big list as far as waterfowl go, but then when good years, these um, ducks and waders are in very good good supply. Greater paint snipe, always a special wherever you are. A uh, number of stalk and heron species in particular when those pans are starting to recede in terms of breeding. As the, the bird in screen, the yellow-billed stalk in last year, uh, between Duncan and I, who sort of counted was just close to 200 nests. Um, which is also very seasonal and the yellow-billed stork is highly threatened species for South Africa. Does it see it breeding in this number is quite exceptional. Uh, Senegal kukal, boardbill roller, rufous wing cisticula, Allen's gallinule, dwarf bitten, the pals fishing owl, limbreast canary, yellow-billed stork as mentioned. So these are birds that are reliant on the pans but also the vegetation adjacent to these floodplains. Then the riverbeds themselves, so of the Limpopo and, and Levugu rivers, there are a number of species which prefer the, the riverbeds and also they to, certainly to be found in floodplain pans on sandbanks and reed beds. Um, picture, bird in picture, white fronted plover is very much a, a sandy riverbed bird. So it's kind of only going to be found along major river systems where a lot of um, open sand is to be found. Um, otherwise, very commonly found sort of coastal plover. Uh, but productive spots here, Levuvu Bridge, um, Makwazi, Limpopo Lookout, Crook's Corner, Mangeba, Limpopo. So certainly, I mean, if, I, if we look at what um, this might be is for the, the general public accessing through Kruger, they would have access to Levuvu Bridge and potentially Crook's Corner. But then to the others, the likes of Makwazi and Limpopo and Mangeba, these would only be available to those who came to Makuleke itself. So here again, Pell's Fishing Owl, white-backed night heron, no matter where in Kruger you are, very big special. White-fronted plover, blue cheek bee eater, white-crowned lapwing. White-crowned lapwing, very much a, um, a riverside bird uh, that prefers large rivers. And saddleable stork, another threatened species that's reliant on good river systems. Then the sand felt with cliffs and rocky outcrops. So this is located more along the uh, Levuvu and also primarily on the western side. So these large sandstone outcrops and cliffs, so in associated sandy bush felt, uh, these include Lana Gorge, uh, Mabien, uh, Motali Gorge, Hutwini, and also the area around um, Outpost Lodge. These mean also some of the highest plant diversity in Makuleke, which again, for those sort of looking at, at botany wise, I mean, Makuleke again has very rich diversity of plant life found nowhere else in, in Kruger National Park. So birds specials long here, Varose eagle, um, very much a cliff nesting species. So for the whole of Kruger, um, Makuleke probably offers the best um, sighting for this particular species. Black stork, which it, this used to be a stronghold for the black stork in, in Kruger. Unfortunately, some of these nests have um, dwindled. So there's an ongoing monitoring of black stork throughout, or well, on a yearly basis to ultimately keep track of these birds. 
So unfortunately not nesting here at present, but still recorded here from time to time. Peregrine falcon, uh, mocking cliff chat, African black swift. African black swift, another uh, rock nesting specialist. So again, probably one of the best sites in Kruger to see this particular species. Streaky-headed seed eater, striped puppet, speckled pigeon, rock marten, number of birds that are reliant on these rocky outcrops. And for ease of access, uh, it's birds to really sort of put onto a Kruger list that can't be put on elsewhere. Then looking at thornfelt. So this is mostly on alluvial deposits or very sandy areas um, along the two rivers. So now this gives you this almost sort of arid Kalahari feel where umbrella thorn is the majority is in the majority along with narrow leaf mustard bush. And these now provide habitat for the for those species that are very much reliant on acacia and arid acacia. So areas immediately north of the Levuvu Bridge, um, ultimately to be found around Return Africa. Uh, the shooting range just far west of Banyini Pan, around the Vikenya Monument, Lullapalm Windmill, and also Eco Training Camp itself. So, specials the likes of Crimson Breast Strike, which is not a very common species in Makuleke, but is recorded here from time to time. Scaly Feathered Weaver, which if you look at distribution, you'll see that it doesn't, it doesn't show that it occurs here, but is in the last two years have moved in quite in substantial numbers in Banyini area and are currently breeding there. Olive tree warbler becoming a relatively common species in the thornfelt in Mokoleke. Meave starling, burnt neck aromomala, very lively little birds, um, bronze wing courses, and a very big special, the three banded courser, all to be found in this thornfelt habitat. Then the fever tree forest. Now, large groves of the fever trees grow along both floodplains, of which predominantly along the, the Limpopo. And then the larger section is down close to the confluence of um, the Luvuvu and Limpopo rivers, in particular around in Wambi and Reedbuck Flay areas. So these of which particular um, racquetal clearing, named as such because the racquetal rollers were actually breeding in the Fiji tree forest um, of the Limpopo, um, around Hulukulu Pan area, Mwambi Pan, Luvuvu East, and also Palm Flay. So areas where fever tree forest, the canopy creates almost sort of a uh, forest environment, uh, which is reliant for a number of now almost forest species. So the likes of racquetail rollers, gray-headed parrot, African golden oriole, tropical boo-boo, crowned eagle, another big special eagle for, for Kruger, and ultimately Makuleke has the highest concentration of crowned eagles breeding um, up here at this, at this time. Uh, green cap terramomola, Retz's helmet strike, scaly throated honey guide. Scaly throated honey guide, quite a, a, it's a particular special in its own right, and not commonly recorded, but it is quite well uh, to be found in the fever tree forest areas. Then Mapani woodland, which dominates majority of Makuleke's area. So it's, Mapani is the dominant tree cover over predominantly the, the central basalt ridges, along with a few baobabs sort of scattered in between. So these areas uh, support quite a high number of species, primarily because Mapani just gives a very good offer in terms of nest sites, um, which is easily to be attained um, within these trees. So birding can be quite slow in Mapani. It's almost sort of a uh, diversity poor species, but ultimately in terms of what it does sort of give, there's certainly plenty to be found. And also depending on the size of, of Mapani, um, particularly on the tar road, the likes of very tall uh, or cathedral Mapani, other areas along the Masishiti and Old Western Boundary and also along Sunpat itself, which gives access to really good tall Mapani, which in particular, the likes of African Golden Oriole in picture and also Honest Chat is quite a high prize um, up here. Then Racketail Roller, which is majority associated with Mapani, White Breasted Cuckoo Strike, uh, Pennant Wing Nightjar, Mottled Spine Tail, Yellow Belly Aromomala, and Grey Penduline Tit. In particular, Yellow Belly Aromomala, not, um, it's another um, sort of 
sort of almost sort of highly uh, specialized species for nice broadleaf woodland. Then the riparian forest, these are sort of forests growing along the, the riverbanks. Now, these just sort of provide habitat to, to now ultimately forest species. So you've now got strips of evergreen riparian forest that now sits ultimately between the river and then the fever tree. So from a productivity point of view, you're really sort of now rivaling the fever tree forest in terms of any nooks and crannies where bird life can sort of go looking to eke out a living. Trees, the likes of large sycamores, bushveld natal mahoganies, anna trees, sausage tree, or habitat for forest birds. That now, if these birds didn't have this, then they certainly wouldn't be, be up here. Um, dense stands of needlebush um, in the down sort of at ground level, which now prov provides habitat for skulking species, the likes of robin chats, scrub robins. And then again, popular spots, the Levuvu Bridge, uh, Limpopo, uh, North River Road, the Mapimbipan and Mangeba, all areas that just give access to some of these good riparian belts. So here, the likes of Crested Guinea Fowl, Thick-billed Cuckoo, Pell's Fishing Owl, Berm Spine Tail, Southern Yellow White Tie, Bat Hawk, uh, Crowned Eagle, Crown eagle in terms of nesting on really large trees. So also this riparian belt just gives good nesting sites for these birds. Thrush nightingales, very highly sought after. Tropical booboo, black-throated wattleye, Narina trogon, and then a number of warblers, particularly in late summer, start to become vocal in these areas. And even mentioning Narina trogon, which is kind of, yeah, it's a, it's another bird that you wouldn't quite expect to be ticking in uh, for Kruger, but if you are lucky enough, then certainly this bird is is there to be found. Um, and then ultimately, sort of that just wraps up um, the habitats of birding in uh, Makuleke. So this just goes on to just some of the summarize some of the the courses that eco training does offer through. Uh, Makuleki camp and a number of our southern camps. So burning in the bush, particularly from a, a burning side of things. So here you're ultimately looking at from basic bird ID and also those who are looking to improve their bird ID and certainly also getting into Makuleki as a birding destination uh, that ultimately is not uh, sort of available to the general public. So getting in and also spending time on bird ID uh, for this course. So it's seven days of theoretical and practical. Um, so he's sort of heading out um, and ultimately birding uh, for seven days straight of just trying to pick out as much habitat as we can and ultimately sure adds a few ticks to that life list, but also just getting to know what you're looking at and how to go about it. So you're looking at ethics, uh, bird ID from a theoretical and practical, I mean, this is happening every day, uh, conservation, equipment, bird behavior, anatomy, and physiology, and also migration. So then at the end of each um, uh, seven days, you then, just to sort of give a slight challenge to also to see sort of what you might have um, gained from your week, is field observation, in other words, practical bird ID. So what's nice here is just to kind of put away um, the apps and just ultimately have a look at the bird and see if you're able to now ID it yourself. Um, electronic slide, so in other words, a slide presentation of identifying birds in a two-dimensional form, and then certainly uh, call ID. So it's just a, a in a way, a nice challenge is to sort of see how your birding has sort of come along over this um, over the past week of the course module. So here is sort of a short um, video. Uh, you have all heard the saying, birds of a feather flock together. Whether you're an advanced birder, for a beginner, we want you to spread your wings and join us on our seven day birding in the bush course in the Northern Kruger National Park. We will teach you the A to Z of birding on daily bushwalks and game drives through the rich history of the Makuleki concession. Our unfenced camp gives you a feeling of true wilderness and coexistence as animals pass freely through. 
Here at Eco Training, birds start with a dawn chorus as your alarm and ends with a chit chit of the fiery net nightjar. From bird identification to bird calls, you will be immersed in a whole new world you may have never noticed. This course is not only for twitchers, but for anyone who wants to improve their birding knowledge in the bush and at home as birding can be practiced everywhere. You will also learn more about the ecological role of birds and how important it is to conserve wildlife areas for migratory birds. With expert instructors, you will also be astounded at what you have been missing out all this time. If you would like to join our flock and learn more about the birds of South Africa, contact us at inquiries at ecotraining.co.za. Okay, so looking at sort of some of the field guide career courses, because certainly ecotraining, one of our sort of backbones is um, creating future guides for the industry. So this is broken down into a number of um, options that you may have of professional field guide which is for the duration of a whole year where you would come away and be doing apprentice field guide uh, apprentice trails guide uh, within that and then a number two bird modules also tracking modules um, along that way and also uh, placement then otherwise kenya is a safari destination the kenya safari guide uh, which is over 28 days uh, field guide practicals. So in other words, if you've done the online uh, field guide, you then have a 35-day practical that you would uh, need to, to attend to complete that um, qualification. And then eco tracker animal monitoring, which takes place over uh, 55 days. Then short courses. These are on duration of seven to to 14 days. Eco quest, um, eco tracker. Safari guide over 28 days, also wilderness photography, as met or aforementioned rather, birding in the bush, uh, wilderness skills. So this is out walking um, on foot, uh, just sleeping under the stars, um, six days, or rather uh, five nights, six days. And then also up in Masai Mara in Kenya, also an option for seven to 14 days. Then Online wise, the online field guide, uh, which then complements the apprentice uh, practical, the 35 days, so this is the eight weeks, the, the theory component. Uh, Nature enthusiast of a seven, seven weeks uh, trails guide, which is over five weeks. And then you'll have the, um, the practical component of your trails, which can be done um, also in conjunction with the apprentice field guide, or sorry, trails guide. Online birding enthusiast over four weeks, and then also online tracking. And certainly all of these would have a practical component to test them later on as well. And then that brings me to the end of this presentation. So yeah, again, Jenna, thanks very much. And hopefully, well, yeah, there'll be a few question and answer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. There's a uh... A lot of birds there. Um, speaking of which, uh, what is your favorite bird? Um, it's kind of it took a while, but southern white crown strikes up here are. It's not a very common species. Um, it's also a species that you would probably find a little bit more frequently further down in Kruger, but from a they just generally. Good little birds in terms of very sort of uh, communal, um, very chatty. Um, they've got this, I mean, their call is quite enjoyable to sort of listen to and watching them in flight and just sort of going about their business. But, and also the fact that it's, yeah, it's just not a very common bird up here. So sort of, yeah, grown a liking for them whenever I do sort of find them um, out and about up in Makuleke. Um, Otherwise... Okay. If it's got feathers, it's good. Um, 
Oh, shoot, I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, now is the time, if anybody does have a question for Ross, please type those through so that we can um, take advantage of having him here with us today. Um, a question for you, Ross. What is the best time of year for bird watching in Makuleki? Um, I could almost answer that and say throughout the year. Um, it's also going to be because why I wouldn't sort of put it as a, a definite is whenever there's water around, it's at its absolute prime. Um, for example, this year, although we've had good rains, it's very lush, but not all the pans are full. For example, Banini is, is bone dry, whereas last year, I mean, Banini was chock-a-block. All the floodplains along the Limpopo were full. So if I'd said to you, if that was how it was going to be every year, then definitely sort of, um, you could say from December right through till April, um, because water is in good supply and as a result, you just spoil the choice. But then with the, the rainfall not as forthcoming as it is elsewhere, I mean, rains are generally very late in Makuleke. They're usually from around February uh, is when it starts. And in a typical year, I'd get all our rainfall sort of in about the first two weeks of February and that's it. So wow. then the best time for for bird watching would then probably be from March, April, May, uh, because then uh, pans are now established and also vegetation is established. And then a number of birds that have been kind of waiting patient for the rains are now suddenly popping out. So all the bishops and widow birds are going to be late in their breeding attempts. So as a result, if you're further south, they're all going out of breeding plumage, whereas up here, everybody's coming into breeding plumage. So in a nutshell, probably, yeah, March, April, May would then be the better times. But then throughout the year, you've just got, because of temperatures are very mild up here, so it becomes a really good option right through until around August, September. Right. So there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of time that you can go see. Uh, go see the birds, if you will. Um, and I know that you mentioned, so the eco trainings birding course is one week long, but if you aren't doing the birding course, you just want to come and enjoy the birds um, in Makuleki, what what um, length of time would you recommend to stay to get a really good uh, opportunity to see as many birds as possible? Um, the minimum would be that um, seven days of birding in the bush. But then if you look at the EcoQuest courses of 7 to 14, um, mm -hmm. those can be ultimately catered. So, they in, so the inquiries would be referred to it as a custom EcoQuest. So in which case, sure, it's not going to be, okay, you have to now get to know the ins and outs of bird life. But to get up here and enjoy Makuleke for what it is and obviously go birding, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a seven day option and then also 14 days. So I would say definitely minimum of um, of say seven days. Uh, as an example, we have our relationship with BirdLife South Africa and they come through sort of for three nights and that it's it gives it just a bit too much of a rush to get around because you can only get to a certain number of places. You, so, and also the last thing you want to be doing is sprinting around and going, looking, you want to take your time. You want to enjoy the surroundings for what they have to offer and not be in the sort of frantic rush around. Okay. Tick here, tick there. You want to be able to get out and just enjoy everything. So yeah, the seven days would be perfect. Great. And so I know you guys don't supply binoculars, but if you could recommend a good pair of binoculars or at least the specs um, for birding in Makuleki, just based on the distances that you're going to be seeing birds, what would your kind of top top recommendation be? Um, for me personally, Vortex. It's um, as far as competitive pricing goes, they sit really nicely in sort of in that good middle range. Um, I mean, the ultimate thing that everyone would obviously go looking is they go out and think, okay, binoculars, I'm going to go off to Makuleke. And then people arrive with these little 8 by 30s or something smaller. They almost look like these things you'd use at a, I don't know, um, some indoor opera or whatever. 
but yeah, those are not an option. Um, so the nice thing, yes, with Vortex, really good solid lens, um, great sort of backup in terms of the product itself. Um, and then in terms of uh, dimensions, sort of personally for me, 10 by 42, um, which is 10 times magnification. And as opposed to another option is eight by 42s because which are slightly smaller and also lighter. But the mm -hmm. one thing with optics these days is that lenses are getting better and better. So even though it's slightly lower magnification, the eight by 42s still do the job, but certainly it just means that maybe distance is not going to be as good. So, I mean, 832 or 842 would be sort of good price wise. But for me, I just, I just enjoy that extra bit of magnification of the 10 by 42 that just, and also just comfort and also being able to, yeah, just get that extra bit of detail that maybe the eight times would just sort of miss out um, majority of the time. Right, right. I knew, I knew you'd have a much better answer for that than I could even think of. So thank you um, for that. Uh, just so everyone knows, we are, um, we're going a little bit uh, over on time today. So if you do need to jump off, just uh, remember that this will be recorded. Uh, we'll just ask you one or two more questions here, Ross, and then we'll uh, let you go for the evening. Um, is there a specific bird that you use as a marker for climate change in that area? Um, it's probably a number of them. I think one that sort of stands out for me, racketail rollers, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, is racketail ro racketail clearing in the fever tree forest was kind of, you're almost guaranteed to get those birds. It used to be uh, two pairs that were nesting in the fever tree forest. Now, I mean, it's a bird that isn't normally in there, but when Bruce Lawson first, um, discovered these birds were breeding there it was kind of well are you sure but it, okay photographs constantly confirmed that uh, but over the last few years particularly prior to the rains last season so 16 17 18 which was sort of peak of drought for particularly the northern part of kruger national park so as a result up here it started really to sort of drying out and becoming a lot more open so as a result it just seems noticeable that the racketails moved out of the fever tree forest um, and headed back into the Mopani woodlands where they sort of belong. Um, so that certainly was a, um, which to me, I mean, whether or not it's true or not, but it kind of, it seemed a lot more very noticeable that these birds had moved out in particular, just becoming so dry and so open. Um, so as a result, I mean, the possible site of where their nest was, that that particular tree, um, the dead fever tree was then collapsed. Um, and then certainly, obviously, water birds, um, because in the majority of time, when the pans are bone dry, these birds are not to be found. But then when water is around, then certainly they are. So although maybe not so much climate change, it's more just the fact the erraticness of water levels that then right. says right when water levels are good these birds are in good number but when they're uh, when water levels are extremely low then they are non-existent so it's so and then you could probably say that for a number of um, of wetland birds and also wading birds um, ultimately right Perfect. All right. Well, let's um, wrap up there for today. I think that we got to the majority of the questions. So thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to uh, be here with us today and provide that great presentation. I know we always have a lot of um, um, popular support for our birding webinars. So um, on that note, um, I will make sure to send out everybody the recording later this week, but thanks so much for taking time to join us uh, today and have a fantastic Wednesday. Awesome, thank you. And if you, uh, if you um, want to go uh, visit Ross and Makuleki in South Africa, please make sure to contact us, or if you have clients that are interested in birding, we would be more than happy to help you out. Thanks so much. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Amy.